me okay? Yeah. All right, pretty good. So thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for hosting me and other people who have flown here and allowing us, giving us a chance to talk about what we do and uh, how we use machine learning for fraud detection. So when I was working on this presentation, I had two things to go for. I could either make my presentation for Chuck or do my taxes. One of these things didn't happen. <laughs> and you guys can guess which one. <laughs> just, just a very brief uh, history about me. Uh, I have an applied math PhD. As doing a PhD, I was focusing on derivatives, options, uh, how these things are priced, what's the right way, what's the fair price of an option or an insurance. So I was doing a lot of uh, data analytics stuff, which was looking at financial data. I've been doing analytics for seven years, PhD is a long, long, long time. And uh, since then, I've been doing data science at Skype. So, being coming from Silicon Valley, I, I always want to talk about how companies are formed and what happened. So, that's my brief introduction to Skype. So, I work at Skype. It's a machine learning company. We do machine learning. It sells machine learning software. What? It came out from Alex Gray's past lab at Georgia Tech. Alex Gray, a uh, machine learning expert, professor at Georgia Tech, he continues to be so because apparently when you're in academia, you can continue to be in academia as long as you want, even when you're actively not working in academia. Which is interesting, I wish I was a professor. But I'm glad that he's here with us and he, uh, he's actually a CTO of, uh, of Skytree. He, he drives product, he decides what functionality we should have in our software. This company actually came out of a lab that he was running in Georgia Tech, which is the fast lab. That's, that's a brief history. Guys are uh, we're a software company. We were built to function on top of Hadoop. We understood very early that uh, Hadoop was the way to the future. Uh, that's, that's, and, and hence, we, we built ground up to work on Hadoop. So think, think about how algorithms could be distributed and such. We were built for automation, speed, and scalability to ensure that uh, you know, we don't have need to have PhDs in order for you to use uh, machine learning or or use products uh, or use the software. There are three ways we allow users to interact with our software. One is the command line interface and APIs. And uh, there's a REST API, there's Java and Python bindings which you can use to run <coughs> the software or use machine learning. And there's also a GUI which is kind of a point and shoot version. Even if you're not expert, you know what is the task that you want to perform. At a high level, you can drill down and find out, uh, look at results, and see how your predictions are doing. Um, we raised twenty million dollars in Series A about just over a year ago, and the technical advisory board consists of Michael Jordan, Jim Nimmer, Dave Patterson, and Pat Handel. So these guys are big shots in academia. If you guys are kind of aware of tracking academia. <laughs> Some more ideas I feel we do machine learning. There are several algorithms that we have. Brain Boost Machine, K-Means, Random Forest, SVD, Principal Component Analysis, Linear Logistic Regressions, uh, SVMs, Collaborative Filtering, etc. Um, we are built for big data, which means that uh, our algorithms scale both with the data size and they also scale linearly as you add more compute nodes. So if you guys are, are like group and Think about how many nodes you could you could work with uh, our algorithm scale linearly with nodes. So any every every other <coughs> node that you're adding, you're getting linear computation out of it. That's that's good, which means that uh, it's not that your performance goes down. After a certain number of nodes, we ensure that it's linear across multiple number of nodes that you'd like to add. Usability, I talked about that a little bit. Um, automation, one-click modeling. If you know what you what you want to do. We can just click go and it will create possibly the best model that it can given the data and generate predictions for you. And I'll give you some examples of that later. So there's, this is a mantra which I missed, I guess, but I think that'll be obvious once I uh, keep talking about it to the talk. Here's the outline of the talk. I'll talk about why Skype big data, machine learning for fraud. Uh, I'll also talk about machine learning for financial <coughs> services. What are the issues, methods, and solutions? I'll try to give you a demo of Skype on a real world data set. And, and, and hopefully, you'll have, you'll have enough time to go through all the three versions that we have to interact with the software. 
So at any point of time, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, stop me, interrupt me. I would like to, like to be more interactive, and, and hopefully we can have a more interactive session. Okay. So the introduction is going to consist of uh, fraud is a big problem. It is both a big data problem and a big cost problem. Uh, why is machine learning necessary to solve that problem, and what's the comprehensive solution, or how does that look like? So this is an interesting statistic. There are about 23 billion credit card transactions that are processed annually in the USA. 23 billion, that's a huge number. We're not talking about millions here, thousands here, so, you know, if you want to do or if you want to do machine learning on that sort of data, you want to have algorithms which are very efficient, which scale well and, and can really manage looking at the different trends and patterns across all those rows in the data set. That's 23 billion. It's much more than what you see in competitions on Kaggle, which is about, you know, you, if, if it's 25 million row data set in Kaggle, it's a big data set, right? So in the industry, you typically look at this data size, which is way, way bigger than things that you listen to elsewhere, and even bigger than what academics report results on. Right? So this is important to note, that this is really a big data problem. It runs into multiple terabytes just yearly. And if you want to save multiple copies of it, do transformations on the data sets, run some ETL processes, that can easily run into petabytes of data. Right. Each transaction has about 100 to 300 attributes. If you want to do a good machine learning job at it, and you want to do that, that means you're adding to your data set. So the more information you want to include in your data set, the more you are going to increase the size of the data. So all this means that this is really a big data problem you have to store it in a distributed fashion across multiple computers. Just some more stats about what's the cost associated. It cost 3.5 billion annually in fraud, just the credit card transactions, which is again a huge number, 3.5 billion. That's, that's, that's the amount that it costs. And you can see the Nielsen report, which shows that the fraud is actually going up year over year. And this data goes only up to 2012, which is unfortunate, because I'm sure the trend continues even today. Right? And we all have known about the breaches that we've heard of recently. This brings us to, to my point about, OK, why do we need machine learning to tackle fraud? There are many different reasons why that is true. The first thing is that traditional ideas of finding fraud patterns in your data they don't work for big data. So if I'm a very smart analyst, I know that, okay, if you went to the gas station and just did a test of your, of, of your card, it's very likely that you're going to commit fraud later. Right? Just with this information, it's not necessarily can, I can actually go through tons of data and figure out if this next transaction that happened in real time is going to be fraudulent or not. That's just one factor. That's just one variable which you'd want to use or just one uh, attribute that you want to use in your data set. Does that make sense? Right? So these rule based approaches don't, don't, don't work very well when your data set is huge and there are multiple attributes that you want to consider at the same time. What you want to do is use some sort of multivariate statistics way in which you can look at many different information together and try to come up with a rule. Transactions, you have uh, historical transactions maybe for this whole year for the entire United States, right? And you have attributes like which state this was committed in, and you have attributes like you know, what were the past five different transactions, and was this transaction fraudulent or not? So that's what the column that you're trying to predict. Was this transaction fraudulent or not? And I'll talk about the setup of machine learning problem a little bit. Um, but when you create a model, you want to use as much data as possible 
so that you have the best model representing everything, right? And then the other problem is about choosing your attributes carefully enough. So you want to choose your attributes carefully enough such that they have the information so as to flag a possible transaction coming in in real time whether it's spotted or not. Is that kind of answer question? Yeah, yeah, you see more Right, right, right. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that your algorithm has to be efficient enough to be able to train using so much data. Right? And then, so the reason that you want to use machine learning is that you can actually use this information that comes from multiple sources. You can actually use ideas and multivariate statistics learn from the data, learn from past examples, and be able to predict the future or the present. Right? So, so you actually use your past data to predict fraud in real time. There was, there was a professor that I had who used to say, uh, the, you know, you, you always hear people in, in, in the financial world talk about uh, how the past is not necessarily predictive of the future. And then you used to add in the sentence and you say that, uh, but if someone is telling you otherwise, he's trying to sell you something. Right. So that was an interesting uh, point that he had. So yeah, you learn from past data and you're trying to predict the future. And there is this idea about fraud patterns changing with time. They, that, the, that the data is transient, the patterns are transient. If you catch some kind of fraud, um, fraudsters quickly try to change the way they have been acting. But the point is, if they have changed something, you should be able to have attributes that reflect or catch, capture that change that they are going to do. Right? So it is possible to incorporate that behavior or the fact that they are about to change through the careful selection of these attributes that you have uh, used to create this data set. And finally, even a tiny increase in accuracy can lead to millions in, in savings. So it's a $3.5 billion market. <laughs> Right, that's that's a cost that you can impact if you have a good machine learning model. Current fraud rates, you're, you're losing three point five dollars billion dollars a year. So if, even if you, you know, help improve your fraud fraud capture rates by a little bit, it's very easy to come up with a model that probably leads to billion dollars in savings. Machine learning on big data. So this is something uh, that shows the trend changing from time. So on the x-axis here is time, and the y-axis uh, in red. In red is uh, the interest in big data. In blue is the interest in machine learning. And you can see that the big data interest has, uh, has been increasing in time. It's probably not news to you guys. What's interesting is that machine learning has not caught up with the increasing interest interests with big data. And it's high time that people start realizing this, that the, if you want to derive the true value from that big data, you got to do machine learning, you got to do advanced analytics. You want to use something that does predictive analytics on large data set in order to derive the value out of the data set. Right, so, so my conjecture here that's that in some time we'll see these two gap, the gap closing away as, uh, as we go further in 2015 and So why do we need machine learning on bigger data sets? The simple point is that machine learning on bigger data sets produces better results. So I'm going to be a little more technical as I go more uh, further in the talk. What I want everyone to understand is that if you want to use predictive analytics, the bigger data that, that you use is better for you. It will lead to highly accurate models, highly predictive models. Right? So that's, that's, that's a key insight. If, you don't, if you're not doing anything, at the very least, increase the amount of sad data that you're considering in order to create models, in order to create models that are going to capture fraud in the future. Right? So if there's nothing that you're going to do, if you want to increase the fraud capture rates, increase the amount of data that you have been looking at. And there are, there are a few things from, from the literature which I can come up with. There's some strong points about uh, the weak law and the strong law of large numbers which kind of give you an idea about, about the fact that as your size of the data sample increases, your quantities of interest that you want to capture from the data uh, goes closer to the true distribution that the data represents. Right? And I'm, I'm talking about this in layman terms, and you can get more technical about this. But again, that points to the fact that uh, if your data set is larger, you will get better results. 
And there have been some, some publications around this. If you guys follow Andrew Ryan, he was talking about this paper in the second bullet point here. Uh, this, he showed that this paper talks about how even for tasks like text, there are text classification, NLP kind of things, which are not necessarily machine learning or you know just one part of machine learning. Even that, you see that as your data set increases, the accuracy of your models keeps increasing. The problem with that study is that it's it's done on on significantly smaller data sets. It's not working on billions of data of rows of data, which is why you know it's 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 only working on billions of data. And there's an idea that maybe your accuracy reaches an asymptote, and maybe you don't want to are not interested for the accuracy because you've already squeezed the maximum accuracy as drops possible from a large data set from that data set. The second second citation that I get from the literature, the study by Biao in the, published in. Journal Machine Learning Research that talks about how one of these machine learning models called Rand Forest is, is consistent and they can actually talk about the rate at which it converges to the most accurate models. Right, so that's my point here. Sometimes big data is all you need. So with that, I want to just talk about an experiment just driving down the point that big data does produce better results and and uh, the bigger the data set, the better, better your results are going to be. And we actually conduct a, a result on the DNA data set. It's a commonly available, publicly available data set. And we go up to 5.1 billion rows. So 5.1 billion elements, I'm sorry. And they are in 200 columns. So there's tons of data here. We are talking about data sets which, which resemble the kind of size of data set that you probably see uh, in, in financial services, the data set that you want to analyze in financial services to be able to predict fraud. Um, and there's some more details which I'm going to skip over, apart from the fact that AUC or AI and the ROC curve is something that is used for evaluation, it's something that is done by most people uh, in the industry. You get, sorry, you had a question. You know, I was going to say, I didn't mean to interrupt, but um, when you go back to your 200 columns of, you know, 51, 20 million elements, can you describe the columns? Is it just arbitrary, or is it basically different attributes that were part yeah. of fraud? So, so no, this is this is the data set, which is a DNA data set. It's not necessarily a fraud data set. As you'd imagine, uh, the data set that comes up with uh, most financial transactions is is uh, is highly private, and uh, it's not results that I can share private, share publicly, or yeah, uh, again, right? But yeah, so what I'm doing is I'm using a proxy data set, which is publicly available. And, and now you can talk about how your results can increase. And this is an exper experiment study that we did uh, this year. And here are the results. So again, we are using this uh, machine learning method called grain boost and machines, uh, which are kind of the holy grail, so to say, in fraud detection right now. And on the x-axis here is the size of the data set in terms of elements. We go up to 5.1 billion rows, billion elements here. And your accuracy or the area on the curve is consistently increasing. And remember, what the model is doing is, is we're using a method called smart search, which searches for the best parameter given a model. And that is used to do parameter tuning for each of the different sizes of the data set. The accuracy is reported on a health out test data set that the machine learning model had not seen in the creation process, which means we are actually making sure that we're not overfitting on the data. We, we, we are we're using this data set and testing on a held out data set. And on that held out data set, uh, 4 million elements, we see that uh, the accuracy is having increasing. Any questions about this? Yes. The column change as well? Was that? Is no, the column, column size is the same. We have held the column size to be consistent with, I think, 200. What was the predicting? What is that? What was the predicting? It's, it's uh, trying to classify DNAs as one category versus another. touch on later, but uh, what I'm trying to say here is that, or rather let me just repeat the question. The question is, uh, how does overfitting impact big data? Like as it is that gets bigger, are you overfitting the data, right? So the idea is that as you get more data, you have a larger chance of capturing the distribution that is represented in the data more accurately than you had when you did not have as much data. 
assuming, of course, there's certain assumptions when it's true that you're drawing this data from a particular uh, corpus which has certain you know, properties and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay. N times. Yeah. N times with different cross validation codes. What was the first question? What is the true positive, positive rate? Um, I would not know. I'm just looking at the uh, AM code here. I'm sure we looked at that, but I have to look at that, so I don't remember. Um, was it just the 50 50 or was it a very small positive rate? No, uh, this data is not very imbalanced. So if that is what you mean. So it's very balanced? Yeah, it's balanced. It's a very good balance. Yes. So how is this appropriate to the fraud uh, case? Because it's fraud with the error, right? Yeah, so, so uh, this. What I'm trying to show here, and through you know some examples in the literature, is that you know if you increase the data set's size or the amount of data that represents something, you have a larger chance of capturing that particular behavior that you want to, right? So in this case, it's you're looking at DNA sequences and you're trying to classify DNA versus being one category or another. In fraud, you're looking at different transactions. You're trying to classify a new data point or a new transaction belonging to fraud or not fraud, right? So that you can class flag it in real. And I understand it doesn't flow over. It might not, because every data set has its own characteristics. But, but this is like a study which, which I'm trying to tell you that you know kind of maybe has a chance of working through. And there are lots of theoretical guarantees also, which ensure that if you're modeling, you know, under certain assumptions, this thing will work. So before I actually uh, tell you how thing or build up the machine learning things, I will tell you what's the solution. Just read the heads for now, and I'll come back to the slide towards the end. What do you need to have a good machine learning solution for financial services or, or for fraud detection? You want to have multiple algorithms and be able to blend them, mix them, uh, combine them in order to get higher accuracy. You want to have something that, automat that does automatic parameter selection, be able to automatically create the best performing model without having to go through manual tuning or grid searches through multiple passes over the data so that it's faster, you can run through multiple methods, allow for usage by domain experts, non-data scientists, higher accuracy, the machine, can, uh, machine can tune better than humans, right? So use something to automatically select the best parameters given a particular method, rather than doing manual tuning over the data again and again. Uh, you want to have speed and scalability. You want to have some way which can give you visual feedback uh, from the data and be able to say whether which model is, perf is performing better or worse. Right, I'll come back to this later. Uh, in, uh, in our tool, there is, but we're not talking about feature selection much in this talk. Yeah, but I'll come back to this. I'll, I'm just talking about the edge right now. So with that, I'm going to go over to machine learning for fraud detection. We're going to talk about countering fraud. It's a machine learning problem, um, talking about some challenges, and finally, solution and GBM and other advanced methods. So that brings me to fraud detection. The problem is really the idea that what you want to do is counter complex and transient fraud patterns, which are not very easy because they keep changing with time. Uh, some, as soon as I say that, it's important to use time as particular attribute in your data set so that you can understand how that how that <coughs> leads to uh, a transaction being fraudulent or not. Analyze multiple and large data set discover pretty few fraud. Uh, there is again the number that I'm quoting which is 23 million uh, credit card transactions uh, in the US. So the machine learning problem. Uh, finally I'm trying to talk about machine learning. How many of you are well versed with machine learning? Can we have a show of hands please? Okay. Okay. So, so this is like about half the people who have raised their hands, and I think uh, a quarter of the people who don't want to raise their hands but maybe know about machine learning anyway, which is great. It's fine. Um, so, so let me just go over how the setup works and why is this a machine learning problem. Uh, machine learning can be talked about in three different ways. One is supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and the final one is maybe a mixed approach where you mix all these methods. The supervised learning method is is one in which you have examples or rows of data, and you have a final column which tells you what this row represents. 
So for example, in the case of transactions, you have, tran you have information about the transaction, which is uh, maybe, where was this credit card last transacted at, right? Is this being transacted at a manned location or an unmanned location? Is this credit card, has this, this credit card uh, was transacted in the same country before or another country before? What is the dollar value of the transaction right now? So there are these different attributes in a particular instance of the data. Based on this, you're trying to predict whether this particular transaction was fraudulent or not. Right? And of course, you have to ensure that you have data where you have specific labels. So for every transaction, there is something which tells you what's the, what's gospel or what is true, whether this transaction was fraudulent or whether this transaction was not fraudulent. Right? So again, there's an, always an issue about you might not be knowing about the transactions which are never reported about whether they were fraudulent or not fraudulent, which brings in a bit of a noise in the data set, but there are ways to deal with that. Right? So is the setup clear that this is the supervised learning problem? Because what you're going to do with your algorithm is try to use this historical transactions and try to predict what are the chances of this particular transaction happening in real time to be fraudulent or not fraudulent. Right? And if it is fraudulent, there's a flag and, and you cannot transact your credit card. It's like another question, how many, because you know it's a, it's a cool group, so ask again, how many people have uh, had their credit card transactions uh, kind of flagged for some reason or the other? So, so pretty much everyone, right? So that, that's an interesting statistic. So I always used to think about, you know, I'm so stupid, I'm the only person who's, who's, who goes through this. But this is, this is good. It gives me some, some you know, happiness and joy that other people in the room have also suffered that. And it's really painful, right? I mean, whenever we, we, we try to buy something and then it doesn't work, and like, what the heck? This is me, it's, it's here, and I still can't get what I want. I'm, I'm not doing something illegal, but you flag, right? And you can, you can come be people like me who have created algorithms like this, which flag uh, things. So, so I hope you understand, right? That's, that's supervised learning. Uh, if you're trying to learn from past examples, predict fraud in real time. Unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is, is more for investigation, more for exploring. Uh, you're trying to look at data. You're trying to divide them into different groups, right? So that hopefully you find something, some group which is interesting enough. So, um, so for example, there is a data set in which you don't know anything about the transactions. Right? You don't know if the transactions are fraudulent or not fraudulent because people didn't report it or people didn't want to uh, investigate it enough to really find out if, 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 if a transaction is going to be fraudulent or not. In that case, you're just going to run an unsupervised learning method, try to group your transactions into, into different uh, clusters and hope that you, you pick up this one cluster which has a high fraud rate in it. And then you go in these clusters and try to investigate them by hand or you know, ask your people to go investigate these transactions. And, and you hope to find some particular region or cluster in which you have a high, high fraud capture rate. Right? Does, that, does that kind of make sense? So that's, that's unsupervised learning. There's a final idea about mixing these two approaches and going over to uh, a mixed approach. And I can, I can talk, by the way, how, how do I know uh, how much time, uh, what time did I start at? Well, you started out, I think. You've been going about a half hour. Yeah. I have half an hour left. You have as long as you want. Okay. okay. Well, unless we you want to talk time. really slow. No, 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 it's fine. Okay. I'm just trying to keep something in my head. So, you're making points of compromise. So, that the idea there is uh, how, how, does, how does fraud happen or how does credit card fraud happen? It only happens because you have transacted your card somewhere, which was a point of compromise. Which means you transacted your card there, that point got compromised, was had been compromised, and they stole your information, and then used your information elsewhere. Right? So the point of compromise is really that merchant where you had transacted your card, and hence you your identity was, was stolen or someone stole your information. Now, the reverse idea of rather than solving the whole thing as supervised learning problem where you're looking at transactions, you could also look at merchants and try to flag these merchants as soon as you have one credit card reporting that there was fraudulent behavior because this were the five different last places that I transacted at. So you're ignoring skimming, you're ignoring identity theft. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there are different different kind of steps right. also. So, skimming and uh, this, the merchant being compromised is really the largest amount, the largest uh, value that you see, right? So, if you hit it that hit that problem and you can solve that really well, the rest of the tower part is not that uh, not not much more. So, it's, and you can detect those point of compromise using a mixed approach or post supervised learning problem because. You know, you have some idea of uh, this point, this point being compromised or not compromised in the past, but you also want to have the information about which group these fall in, these modules, right? Is it a row group, is it not group? In those kind of cases, a mixed approach works much better. So, what is the common issues that you see in these? In this case, I'm just talking, going to talk about the first case, which is a supervised learning approach to solve these problems. And, and hopefully that will be, be insightful to some people. So, one of the common things is that your data sets are always imbalanced. You have too few examples of known fraud that you know from the past. Right, so if you have uh, 23 million transactions happening at a fraud rate of, you know, even a percent, which is very high already, you will see that uh, you you only you you actually you know reduce the size of the positive samples by a lot, right? So it's only a tiny fraction of the entire data set is fraudulent, or is the data set which you know was fraudulent for sure? Because there might be cases in which you never looked at your you know credit card or your history of transactions and did not report uh, uh, you know a theft or or a transactions which is fraudulent. Right, so that's one of the com one of the problems that is your data set is highly imbalanced, which means that your labels are disproportionate. The positive labels or the fraud labels are too few, and the non-fraud labels are too high. This is a machine learning problem because in that case, you can think about uh, an algorithm which is trying to learn. If 99% of your data is is not fraud, and you what you care about for the algorithm is to predict fraud. It can be 99% accurate by just spreading fraud all the time, right? This, this is all the interview stuff, but, but it's important to like realize that okay, yeah, this is this is this is how it is. So you want to make sure that you remove or take care of the imbalance somehow, so that the algorithm is not fooled into believing that it's producing a better model, whereas the model is really crap, right? So so that's one of the most important issues. What to optimize? What is it that you want to optimize? Do you want to optimize for the fraud capture rate? If you're optimizing for a fault capture rate, do you want to include the false positive rate in mind, right? So do you want to somehow talk about the false positive rate or fix a particular false positive rate which we are okay with? You know, you want, you're going to annoy your customers as soon as you're flag flagging your transaction as fraudulent. All of us, with a show of hands, we just agreed that you know all of us have gone through that. It's not fun. It's not fun. It's very painful. So what is it? Can I really put down a cost to that? Of course, the cost of fraud is very simple because as soon as someone is trying to transact something, you have the fraud dollar value there. Right? So you can take that into account. However, it's very hard to put a value on the false positives. What is the loss of a customer being not happy with the service that you provide? Right? So there are all these open-ended questions. What loss functions to use? You have these algorithms and maybe you want to minimize the fraud dollars. If you are trying to minimize the fraud dollars, uh, the, the cost of fraud, do you minimize the L1 error? Do you minimize the L2 error? What is the error that you want to minimize? There are all these questions around which are never very easy to answer. We're very, very open-ended. How do you handle missing values in the data? Sometimes you don't have information about your customers. You have tons of attributes, but for some reason, you did not have uh, those attributes filled up for a lot of your users, or a lot of your customers. How do you handle that? Which algorithms do you use? There are multiple algorithms uh, which you could choose from. What is it that you want to use? So, we're going to talk about the industry science solution. It's something that comes from experience working with, the, with, with our customers. It seems that the most common approach to solving such problems is the brain boost machine. Are we okay? That was uh, discovered or like proposed by Friedman in 2001, and there are many variants of, uh, of that model around. What it does it is it sequentially, sequentially combines multiple simple models, and these simple models are called uh, base learners. Right? So with each new model, you're going to try to correct the mistakes 
that your model has made until now. Right, so it's this, pro this procedure is called boosting. Uh, you have a base learner, which is a very simple model, and uh, it's, it's going to try to predict fraud and not fraud. In the next step, you're going to try to use another simple model to correct the mistakes of your previous step. Right, and you do that iteratively enough, and you hope to uh, make your predictions better. You're finding more on it. So, it can also be seen as a media combination of these models where the weights or the, or the how you combine these models are carefully chosen. Uh, the base model in this case is decision trees. Again, decision trees are a bunch of yes-no questions through which you get to a final classification or a solution. Uh, this, this idea is uh, inspired by Green Descent, and what I'm talk, trying to explain this in very layman terms, so it, can, it might not be very technical, but uh, bear with me with that, that. We can talk about it in details also. I'm going to talk about some of the pros and why is it that the industry like this so much. Uh, some of the pros is that it's, it's, it automatically handles missing values. So the algorithm does not have to, you don't have to worry about you know, fixing your missing values by something or imputing the means, imputing things that you don't know about in your set uh, by, through some artificial means. It's a very, it's, it very naturally goes into the algorithm itself, which is why people like this algorithm a lot. It also builds highly accurate models. If you want to do like intense amount of cross validation, look at test data set. If you're just doing one train test split, you'll see that oh, the accuracy is pretty high. I'm very happy with this. It's actually a pretty good model. It's it's it's, it's, it's so accurate that even used to think that uh, there's something about this uh, in the very beginning that's probably it's 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 almost like cheating because you're doing so well over other methods that were there. Eventually, people have some understanding. Of the biggest thing is that it captures non-linearity in the data. So if your data has some non-linear relationships, as opposed to using linear models, this can capture non-linearity, which is really good. Uh, it does not require deep understanding of the data. So most data scientists on calculus, the first thing that they want to do is take a data set, apply a brain boosting machine on it. Right? If you're, if I'm sleeping, just part out, I have a set, what I'm going to do is use brain boosting machine. It's very good, it works beautifully, always produces decent results. Right? Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the issues with it. It, it probably does not handle data sets with high dimensions well. So if your data set is broad, right, it's, 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 it's long, which means multiple rows, broad, which means multiple columns or attributes, if it has tons of columns, there is a possibility that CDM does not do very well. It minimizes bias in your data because each time you're trying to minimize the error, but there, is, there isn't that notion of ensembling or reducing the variance of the data, right? So oftentimes, if you have noisy data, uh, it might not be looking at, or at avoiding overfitting very well. So again, there's a chance of overfitting when your data is very noisy. And, and there's some anecdotal evidence for this, and you can, you can find, find pieces, or, or some group people and left talking about this as well. It's not the best at handling very high imbalance in the data if you want to use it as is. You know the the, the the root version of it, so to say. It requires extensive parameter tuning. Again, it is highly accurate because there are these tons of parameters, there are these dials that you can tune, and it is uh, it requires extensive parameter tuning, which allows you to get that accuracy. As soon as it allows you to get get that accuracy, it is actually overfitting. It is also you know you want to make sure that you're not overfitting and you're tuning everything just to the right amount so that you don't overfit the data yet get the value of the data. Yes. So imbalance is uh, sorry, I was maybe speaking to that side. Um, imbalance in the data set is is basically you're trying to learn from the data. You're trying to learn, for example, fraud or not fraud from the data. Like what characteristics are predictive of fraud or not fraud. But there are too few examples of fraud. Right. So your data set is imbalanced because very few examples of one class, which is the class that you want to predict. Right. So the and total evidence that I was trying to give around this was that if you want trying to if you're looking at accuracy as a metric, as how accurate your model is, then a model you can you can be fooled into believing that your model is very good if it just predicts not fraud all the time. Right? There's a transaction that goes through, it's not fraud, it's not fraud, not fraud. You get 99 percent accuracy if there is one percent of fraud in the data set, right? So that's probably not the right metric to look at. And and that problem arises because you have high imbalance in the data. Right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah, you don't need to know much about the features in your data set per se, um, but you need to know about which dials to tune, right? So if you if you want to think about it, these are like open parameters. Uh, it's like fitting a 10 degree polynomial versus an 11 degree polynomial, like right? 10 degree polynomial, right? So how much and you know what is the right particular end end to to tune? That's one way of understanding it. And the thing is that with GBM, there are about you know you can there's a chance that you can you would want to tune three to four parameters, right? And tuning them in combination is complicated. It is accurate in general, and like it, it, that accuracy might not go over when you have imbalance in your data set. So you have to think about ways of improving it when your data set has imbalance. Right? So in general, yeah, exactly. Right, it might not be. Oh, sorry. So high dimensions, uh, I was talking about uh, a little bit ago, which is basically your data is broad, right? So high dimensions, it means you have tons of attributes in your data. So number of columns is high. That's amazing. So like that's just the dimensions, right? Like, Say that again. But in that case, there are other algorithms that you might want to consider uh, rather than considering GBM. Yeah. yeah. So is there kind of a sweet spot for GBM on a uh, number of dimensions or the width of the, the, the breadth of the data? Obviously, yes. it's used quite often. Yeah. So what is the sweet spot? For so typically, I would say, like, if you have, it's, it's, it's tough enough with the number right now. It depends, it depends on, the, on your data set, what kind of data it is, how many rows there are. I tell you, like you know, if you have some example, like text examples, in which you have tons and tons of uh, of columns, right? Uh, if you have a tweet and you are looking at all the possible words in the dictionary as your possible columns, then that's huge. The dimension is huge. There's no way you're going to use GBM. That. That's an extreme example. But typically, I'm saying I'm going to say text. If you have text real features that you want to use in your data set, um, it is it is tough for GBM to perform very well. It might, but but you want to consider make sure that you are. TBM does really perform the best in that case. Yeah, some of these characteristics maybe because uh, you're using the decision trees as the base models. For example, uh, to make sure that your data set you are not overfitting, you want to uh, make sure that you do not use very large decision trees. So your decision trees want to be need to be shallow to ensure that you're not overfitting. So could you use your model to trim the number of uh, columns that you want to use for attributes? Basically? You could, you could. You could use the variable importances which come out as so an output from that. Would that be the same model or a separate model? It'll be a separate model. Okay. So next I'm just going to talk about how you overcome some of the odds. And uh, so the data set it does not handle high dimensionality very well. SVMs handle data sets with high dimensionality very well. Um, there are other ways uh, of, of handling the bias or, or the problem with uh, variance in, G, in GBMs. So it might not have a lot of, uh, it, it might not be very good at handling the variance in the data set. But you can tend to work with the ensemble of multiple GBMs in order to reduce the variance in your data. You could also use a stochastic GBM, which has been proposed and people use this quite often, in which each page learner is built on a different sample of the data set. Right? That, that gives you that idea of ensemble and, and posting together, and both of them together can help you prevent um, you know, counter both bias and variance. Right? Uh, so just, just one point about each of these things. I talked about stochastic GBM a little bit. Each piece learner or each decision tree uses a different sample. So you first build a particular model and try to make some predictions. 
you use a different sample of the model, or maybe a, a bootstrap sample which has some common rows, and try to get make make the predictions right on data on some of the points that you didn't get right in the first go. Right, so it has to be done in a very smart way. You have to make sure that you you're not you're not committing any mistakes, which are very easy to commit in this case. So be very careful with that. Uh, you also don't want to use a very small. Uh, you want to make sure that there's always some overlap between your subsequent trees, because it doesn't make sense to reduce the error, one particular error from in one model and then improve upon the mistakes made on the previous model using another data set, right? Or so that you want to ensure that the overlap is very high. You can use mixed models, so you can use linear and statistic models to combine with GBM, and, and these techniques are very popular uh, on, in competitions, where you want to maybe look at the text features or dimensions, the high dimensions which with high cardinality or categorical variables, use linear models or logistic linear models to treat those and combine the results from them with the results that GBM gets out of this. That, that seems to improve accuracy a little bit. There's a high chance of error profiting. Of course, it's, 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 there's some basic techniques here restrict to simple based learners. Make sure that you're tuning it well with uh, restricting your size of the thing that you want to grow, or each base learner that you want to grow. And you want to check, carefully check for generalization error. What's the cross validation data in the data set? How does that look on a testing data set? And how does it generalize? Right. Talk about some of them, and uh, this is the remaining stuff. Uh, overcoming the odds, not the best at handling high imbalance of the data. Again, I talked about ensemble GBMs, talk about uh, stochastic GBMs a little bit. You can also consider random forests. Both these three techniques help in reducing the variance in the data and also help you solve the imbalance problem that you see in your data set. Uh, it requires uh, extensive parameter tuning. Uh, you can use uh, techniques which automatically select for the best parameters uh, given a particular model. So this particular uh, thing that we developed at SkyTree is called Smart Search. It's pathfinding technology. What it does is it does basic optimization that iteratively learns from the previous iteration. So so that's, that's, that does not sound right. Iteratively learns from the previous iterations. So it, uh, what it does is uh, it will restrict the space that it wants to search in and make, and the next, next point that you want to look at, it's going to make informed decisions based on what were the points that it iterated over previously. Right, so it's rather than doing just a dumb grid search over your space of possible parameters, you are now trying to be smarter about it, use Bayesian optimization, in order such that your next place that you're looking at there's a higher chance of getting a better results. So this is only possible because you're trying to understand the surface in which your solution lies. Right, so you're trying to understand the topology, trying to understand how the surface look, and uh, trying to get to the optimal point faster. Right, so this leads to significant reduction in the amount of work that your algorithm has to do because it's it's trying to go do away with uh, with dumb parameter search which will be like grid search right just searching over the entire parameter sage uh, space by dividing into small rectangular chunks uh, now you can really go from one point to another point which is far away because your previous points have informed you to do so right there's a high chance in the next point you get better results yes so with smart search um, how many models is it using yeah, to this point where it's then saying, here's your optimal parameter. So the, the thing is that you can you can let it run as many times as you want. So you can you can specify the iterations. And I'll show you a two or three demo of this, in which you can specify, you know, I want to have, look at 100 iterations. So 100 different parameter combinations. Right? So it's first parameter combination, second, so on and so forth. You can go to the 100 parameter combination, and it will look at the best results in these 100 iterations. Right? Uh, if you're doing grid search, you can only look at the, this is my minimum. Uh, value of x1 is like a minimum value of x2, maximum value of x1, maximum value of x2. Look at in this particular space, right? So it's going to try all possible combinations, which is going to be very slow, rather than using an informed thing which, where the previous iterations actually kept in mind. So that's that's the idea, and it's actually pretty cool. It works very well. Uh, a lot of data scientists find it very hard to beat this one, which is which is good for us. We always have something to fight with internally uh, to to make sure that you know we we justify our spot in the company. Um, it's it's typically not simple to distribute this, but there have been recent uh, advances, and, and there are some distributions around which which do actually do a better uh, job at uh, at distributing uh, rainbows and machines across multiple nodes. Yes. Is it cabin? 
Um, you can, um, that's, uh, I, I don't know. I'm, oh, I'm on okay. So it's like, uh, this brings me back to the slide that I was talking about earlier, and I've, I think I've touched about lots of things, and I'm going to look at visualization a little bit, and I'm going to give you a brief demo. Uh, again, using multiple algorithms for higher accuracy, I touched about doing posting, random precision forest, and uh, SVM. Stack models and mixed models work better in proper practice as well. They always help in uh, improving the accuracy. Uh, we have to very, be very careful in order not to overfit the results here. Automatic parameter selections. Uh, again, machine can tune better than a person. Right? Given between me and a machine, I'm going to trust the machine more unless I know something that the machine does not know. But the machine can read that data much better than I can. I cannot scan billion rows of data. I cannot scan hundreds of columns of data. So, machine, I leave the machine to tune for higher accuracy. Allow for usage by non domain experts. So it makes it makes things to use very easy. So even someone who has not done uh, machine learning at all, has no experience in data science, can just say, this is what I want to predict, do smart search, and it will give you a model which produces the highest accuracy. Right? That's almost putting me out of job. Right? Because you don't really need to uh, think about or understand the algorithms very well. You can really Kind of understand if you are interested in assigning algorithms, you can be the outputs, you can figure out exactly what's going on in the output, but it helps you do that automated thing of one click model. Uh, again, there's this idea about speed and scalability. Uh, we are faster than anything that's around. Uh, we also can catch this, which allows you to make multiple passes of the data, get the speed spot or the best set of parameters faster. And hence, that helps you capture the latest the fraud. You can retain your model as quickly as you want to. Anything that was just reputed to be fraudulent can be included in your model. Your model can be retrained. That particular trait will be captured, and with that will help you predict new incoming fraud. Right. So, constantly updating your models is very important. And this is interesting because you know a lot of these uh, big, large financial giants they're not very, really, they have, they're very, really, you know, they're not very really, mm, happy about their model quality. Which is why they don't, they're very uh, wary of uh, updating your models more often than, than maybe even a year. And things change a lot in a year. You want to capture all that changing trends and want to, and, and want to make sure that your models are updated more frequently than what it is done in the industry right now. This is a visualization optimization we're going to talk, not going to talk about. Um, let's see how it works. How many do we have time? Good? Okay. So, um, I'm going to do uh, a few things. I'm going to take you through the command line interface. I'm going to do some Python SDK stuff, uh, and I'm going to visualize the results in the GUI. And let's let's see let's see how it works. And this is how the Skyway workspace uh, looks like. It has three different ways, or in fact, four different ways. It has REST, REST API, it has Java SDK, Python SDK, and one Java guy. So I'm not going to screen that. But I shouldn't be doing that. So the four different ways to use it: command line interface, GUI, SDK, Python SDK, and Java SDK. And uh, I am going to now switch over and hopefully show you some things. Let me just get things up. I'm just going to take you up. take you a minute, hopefully. Hopefully my internet is still working here. And uh, so this is my data set, and uh, this is a data set which was released by uh, the census department, I think, and uh, it's been around, people use this a lot because it has 
one of very nice characteristic has uh, these demographic information, and then what you're trying. So you have the years spent in medication. Uh, what is the impact? The 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 maximum medication, bachelor's, uh, PhD, master's, uh, ninth grade, and so on and so forth. You have information like uh, medication number. Just blow it up a little bit here. The marital status, occupation, relationship, race, and so on and so forth. And finally, you have the yearly income. This is what you're trying to predict, right? So you want to predict whether the person is uh, is, is earning less than three thousand dollars a year or earning greater than three thousand dollars a year, right? So what we're going to try to do is going to use information of the person or the demographic information and try to predict whether the person is. Uh, how likely is a person to earn greater than three thousand dollars a year or less than three thousand dollars a year? Any question about the setup? Is it is that problem clear? Oh, can you read? Can you see if uh, yeah. how visible it is? Okay, it's probably okay. Right. Um, we'll get into that debate of Emacs versus VI here, but just keep away from that. Um, so. Let's just uh, show you what you do. <coughs> command line interface is a simple shell uh, script, and you can just like type the string into the command, and I'll, I'll explain to you what these things mean. Calling Skyview server at the very beginning, you're using the GPT module, which is playing most of trees. It's doing great most machines with where each base learner is a tree. It's a decision tree, right? Um, and we're specifying the training name. The training name is said to be the adult.sp, which is the data set which I'm just showing you. Uh, I'm also specifying a health out test data set, that those are test data sets for which I want my predictions. Like this is a common thing that people do in machine learning. You learn on data set, you predict on something which is health out. Right? You, I'm, I'm going to do a hold out ratio of 0.3. What this helps me do is, uh, is use a health out ratio in the training data set itself in order to test how my models are doing by choosing different parameter combinations, right? Again, something that's commonly done in machine learning. You could also do cross validation, which is slightly more compute intensive, but hold out ratio typically, if the data set is large enough, looks okay, but not going to go much detail here. Uh, I'm also going to define uh, train labels in. Uh, that adult data labels is, uh, has the label predicted, has the, has the two labels in it. I'm going to save the predicted labels as predicted labels. Now this is something that is uh, that will have my predictions for the test data set that I had specified here. Right, so this is the test data set, and I'll have the predictions uh, here. And uh, I'll save my probabilities that I was predicting, save the model as well. Uh, now this is something that, so if I did not specify any of these, right, these things require you to understand the model that you're using. Those parameters are are uh, something which are closely tied to a brain boosted machine. So what this means, the kind of you you can totally not use that and just use smart search. And then what it's going to do is it's going to pick these parameters uh, by itself automatically. However, because you think it, you might know better than the algorithm, you can guide the algorithm. What this is doing is it's saying that don't look at the number of trees which is greater than five hundred. So that's score in 500. Don't look at anything which has number of trees greater than 500 when you train the model, right? And I'm just doing that because then I'm going to go faster. The max plays don't look at anything which has max between five or three greater than five. Again, for speed reasons, I'm just going to show that uh, this thing hopefully works quickly enough. And then I'm specifying smart search, and then specifying to look at 40 iterations of smart search. So it will do 40 iterations of the data and hopefully get produce a good result. And we'll, we'll look at the results and why the results will be churning. I will look, show you another data set. I'll, I'll show you the, the SDK version of it. Any questions of how this works? Yes. Who's that? So sampling ratio is what uh, makes this makes the GVM into a stochastic GPT, right? So every base learner or every subsequent tree is going to take 50 percent of data sampled with replacement. Right, so it's using a app sample um, that helps uh, reduce the variance again for the ensemble. It, it brings in the ensemble nest in the models. Any, any questions about anything here? So again, the thing that I'm selecting, I can totally delete that. This thing will still work. 
but if you are an experienced data scientist, you could use it by giving the algorithm these cues. Now, instead of searching for the infinite space, it's going to restrict the space in which it's looking for a solution. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Okay, so let me just run this and uh, you look at the logs later. Ooh. Hang on, let me just let me just come back to this. I'm going to come back to that later. Let me just go to the uh, other versions in which you can access it. I think what has happened is uh, there was a new version released and not calling it properly. But let me just uh, try to explain to you some other ways of accessing the same things. Interface works. The same thing that I talked about earlier. You can actually do that thing with uh, with a Python SDK also, and what this is doing here is, uh, I mean, I'm using an IPython notebook to show these results. You can you can see that the username here is uh, demo Chuck as Skytree. It's trying to connect uh, its connection things. I'm allocating the requesting from some environment resources, defining projects, and next I'm going to be in the data set. So these commands help me read the data set, create a data set, and set a configuration file. Right, so in this case, once my data set has been read, I'm defining a random forest, and for random forest, I'm calling an RDF configuration, specifying a holdout ratio of 0.3, doing an object, specifying that the objective column or the thing that I'm trying to predict is the yearly income, the number of trees are going to vary from, uh, I'm just going to try 10 and 20 number of trees, and I'm going to pass it into a train tree model, pass the configuration to be the random config, and uh, create this model. So I've already done this stuff, and you can also see that in the GUI. What this is doing is, uh, you know, as soon as I click on, uh, you can see that data set has been imported. And you can view the details of that data set. You can also look at the models that have been created. And here we have created, this is the first one that was creating. You can view the training result. And you can see that there were two different tree numbers that we looked at. It was 10 trees and 20 trees. And the accuracy, or GD, which is directly proportional to the area under the curve, that's on the y-axis. 
that's how well you have done on your training. This is how your cross validated results look like. You can look at other metrics that you want to. You can look at precision, for example. And we can go back and even look at another model, which is probably more interesting. This is another model. And here we have looked at different number of trees, 5, 10, 15. Uh, some, so all these dots represent number of trees that we have tried. You can see that the genie is changing along this curve. And this, these curves essentially help you pick how overfitting, how much you have overfit the data, at what point does your accuracy curve start, uh, start, starts to actually plateau. And you can pick that point uh, in order to, for your testing purposes. You can also look at multiple uh, metrics like capture deviation in this case. You can look at the F-score and you can look at the accuracy. So there are different things that uh, people who do machine learning are interested in. And uh, you can always look at these metrics, uh, vary them across different uh, parameters. S-axis is a number of trees in this case. You can also look at uh, how the data set looks like. So this is like a small view of the data set. You can look at uh, each row as a data set. You can also uh, understand different features of the data set. So let me just blow it up again a little bit. So you have ID on the first column. You have the age, the work class, the final grade, education, so on and so forth. And uh, categorically, um, it tells you whether this particular column in the data set was an integer or a text or uh, a categorical data set or categorical, categorical column. This makes sense. This is also looking, this is essentially looking at features in your data set or columns in your data set. And this distribution gives you a quick view of how your data set looks like. Right? So uh, for anything which is like a histogram or a bar graph, it is telling you, OK, in the yearly income, I have so many people uh, who are high income earning people, and the rest of them are low income earning people. So it's, it's a quick way of looking at how each of the columns look like. There are also these other things, metrics that you might be interested in, like minimum, maximum, mean, standard deviation, and so forth. You can also look at each of any of these things in more detail and uh, see what is the number of categories. So you can look at 20, 40, 60, and it will change, and, and so on and so forth. So you can also change the, uh, the X label to education. Now it's showing how education is changing. These are different columns and the counts on each of those histograms. Right? So it's a good graphical way of looking at uh, many different things. One of which is how your data looks like. And uh, one of, again, the other thing is uh, look at how your different runs look like. And I'm going to very quickly look at uh, what the graph shows me. So this is my data science process. Uh, this is the DAG or a DAG view of what a data scientist does. And I can you know, quickly log into another project and show you more com how complicated this can do. So what this is showing is that you've created four models and you've done this from the training data set. Right? So if you are doing multiple transformations on your data set, a complicated sequence of transformations, and you're building models of those, it's a quick visual way of showing you what it is that you have done for this particular project. Right? So it's a good organization in terms of uh, looking at how many projects you have, and uh, you know how many more data sets are there, how many results, the models are there, and I haven't really tested any results yet. So my test results are zero. Right, and because it's an interactive Python notebook, um, let me just try to do this once more, and uh, I'm going to try to do it live and hope it works. Um, so, so I, I try to do some transformations here. What that is going to do is create another data set from this data set. So now, if you were looking at this carefully, I have two data sets now, and it was one earlier. What I did was I essentially just ran this command in which I removed a particular column. So you know, data scientists do a lot of feature engineering, feature transformations, removing columns, adding columns, creating columns, doing SQL kind of joins and uh, to create more features. This helps you do those things, right? So what this is doing here is uh, doing that on the API, uh, on the on the Python SDK, and you can quickly view it. So earlier my data set view had just one data set which was trained into one. Now this is another thing, which is RMWC, which I named it. And you can look at the details on that as well. right? And uh, you can, again, get details in that. Uh, you will not see the columns. Uh, and now, because I also ran another model command, you can see the star, which denotes that uh, it's still running that process. So 
So what I'm trying to do here is trying to run the GVT with a hold out ratio of 0.3. It's just tuning over 100, 110, 120 rows. And I'm, I've left every other parameter to be default. And I'm passing this data set which has the first column removed. Right? So you can look at, uh, I'm not sure if you can uh, view it yet, because the ML is still in progress. And it's giving you quick feedback online. It's telling you, okay, two of 120 trees done. And it's telling you 100 of 110 trees done. Right, so it's giving you these feedback, and the ones that are ready to be used, you can view the tuning results, which I just did. Uh, let me just go back and uh, think about what could be interesting for uh, to see here. Let me once again go to the graph, and now you can see there's another chain emerging here. So I started from the source data set, I removed one column, create another data set, and then build a model on top of that. Right? So if you're a data scientist, you're going through a huge munching process of, uh, of, of transforming your data sets, making multiple copies, or uh, this is not by the way multiple, making multiple copies here because it's already known as the main reference data set. So in this case, it's, uh, it's, it's a quick visual view for a particular data scientist to figure out in this project, this is the state. And maybe now what I want to try, and I can look at the accuracies of each of these models, and it will maybe inform me that the next thing I want to try is to try a different body, different kind of model, right? You can you can uh, go through this and figure out what was exactly the end that you did in this particular process. You ran a GVT, your learning rate was 0.1, that was three. You can look at all these parameters which were used by you to create the model. In the previous iteration, you can also see what was the uh, employee parameters. Uh, I created this data set from the original data set. This is going to tell me. What was it that I filtered? In this case, it's telling me that you filtered the column works work class. Right? So are there any questions about this? Is this kind of clear about what it is that the GUI and the SDK together are trying to do? Yes. Yeah, I got a question about the algorithm that I've seen. Yeah. When you're executed, and when your early slide says stop is being used in the data preparation. So and I noticed on that to do with the CLI interface, you actually have the SkyTree server in Okay. So is the algorithm running in Spark? Is it running in Mapreduce? Are you using more distributed? Uh, so, oh, it's, it's, the machine learning is our own. We only use Spark for data transformation. Yeah. So, so you have processes that yeah. run on every single node. Precisely. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, what have you scaled up? Well, what? Like how many nodes? Oh, we have we have tested on multiple nodes. We have customers who have installed us on over 100 nodes, like 300 nodes. So, so you got this, this is what comes to my mind. But yes, exactly. Right now, and every, and every node has one good process, one another. Yeah, each node has a process one another. Yeah. Skytree is installed on each specific node. So and and yeah, you, you have to in fact install on multiple nodes and scales up pretty much making a million times performance. And it's just sitting there, so it's just sitting there listening for a job to come in. Right. So the, the resource allocation from Yarn, are you, how are you to, you know, when, when you go to submit, are the resources allocated in Yarn permanently allocated out to your nodes, or are they done on a job-by-job -job basis? Can you follow what I'm saying? Wait a minute, you're, yeah. you're implying that you're using Yarn to manage SkyTree processes, or you have a SkyTree to a separate process outside of the do? Uh, Yarn would, uh, would, would call SkyTree. Yarn would allocate resources to SkyTree. So your SkyTree really isn't being installed. If you've got a 300 node cluster, yeah. you're not physically putting it on each machine, putting a SkyTree process. It's, it's coming under Yarn. Yarn would send it out, like Spark. Uh, I think we do install it on each of each and every node. I think, I think you're allocating the resources yeah. using Yarn that each one of your processes is utilized. Right, on each node. Right, but I'm so you specify the memory, you specify the. Right. Uh, right. So, so you're doing all your communication, and I guess it's you do your... Yeah. Which is really no communication I, I can answer that. So okay. in terms of how we're installed, so it's actually in the binary installed machine, but it's not a service. It's not running actually each process piece until Yarn kicks it off. So okay, so, so, so it is on process by process base. So I, can, I come in, I make I request uh, some resources from Yarn, and then your server, you know, those some of the resources 
that the young guy gave it, when you're kicking off those resources, you need to know it's basically allocated off the young, right? Exactly, yeah, okay, exactly. What, what do you use for the communication between the different nodes? Um, we use a HPC technique, oh. we use TCP, okay. not, not TCP, IP, just straight TCP, just keep the overhead minimal. So you just use the sockets? Yeah, oh. straight, straight sockets communication. Okay, are you, are you doing some raw sockets and using like zero C? Uh, we use raw sockets, and if available, we'll use a uh, if in a band back plane. Yeah. We have that. Okay. But, you, but you're not using any entire level of strap to just one outside? No, just straight sockets we do. I'm glad Richard was around. I'll take those. Any other questions about about or about this or whatever I've shown you today? Do you have a way to compare the results of all of those models at the same time in the interface? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have we have different ways of uh, looking at results. You can like you know, in, in the sense that. When you compare results, you actually look at different columns. You can select different models and look at results in the test results page. I can show you the test results page. You can't see the results because I haven't uh, created any results yet. But there is a page which has these uh, results. And it's empty right now because I, I, haven't, I haven't generated any results. But yeah, there is a way of uh, comparing across models in that go form. What is the accuracy that each model is giving you? Each time you test a different model, you're going to take a you can see that. Actually, I would want to follow up on the question. Um, actually, I didn't hear it very well. So, <coughs> so kind of like, how do you distribute your computing around different nodes? I guess that's that was the question. I guess I didn't really get the answer. So, so you, you can run this within one single node. I can see that. But when yeah, we can have a run this on. Cluster, we can run this on multiple nodes as well. But how do you use it? The distributed as map reduce job is uh, like the a answer to the question ID. was there's a process installed in every machine. When the request comes in, Yarn will spin it up, and then they will communicate over TCP. Uh, yeah. Okay. And and your library is is it built up like uh, NumPy or those, you know your no, platform it's, is built it's, on which kind of library? So, I mean, it's uh, we, we we wrote that on C++, but that's okay. besides the point. So. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm using a Python mode because it's a uh, it's easy, but I can use a Python anything. Yeah. Um, we have a model that you want to use in production. Is there a way to publish like a, a service to call it? That's that's a separate question, and uh, I I don't work on that much. But, okay. but yeah, I think I think there is, and I can I can get you to Richard, connect you to Richard, who can answer. Much more. Is it open source? Um, no, we're proprietary. If that was not clear, sorry. Okay, uh, and there are no further questions. Actually, yeah. I read one. A few days ago, Amazon released a machine learning on the cloud. I mean, I just want to see what's your take on that. Because I see lots of competition, you know, here in this space. Yeah, there's some competition. It's like interesting and healthy competition in this space, which is all it's good, right? It makes us uh, uh, be on our toes and, 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 <laughs> and, and work as hard as we can so that we just provide value to customers, right? So, um, I don't know what much to say about that. At the end of the day, there's a lot of machine learning libraries out there. You're free to choose amongst them. Right. And I think the point that we've been seeing here is that SkyTree has a value proposition that's worth considering. They're not open source, but if you want the best value for your company, that's kind of the point of the product. You're switching to sales, but no, so what? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I was, I was having trouble saying that. <laughs> but uh, I think if there are no further questions, we'll call it a day. Thank you so much for having me here. And uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much.